Good evening. Happy Halloween. I'm Teresa Tobin. I'm your humanities librarian. And it is, as always, my privilege to welcome you to an Authors at MIT series event on behalf of the staff of the MIT Press Bookstore and John Jenkins, a manager of the Press Bookstore and the MIT Libraries. Tonight, oh, the Authors at MIT series is a series of celebrations of book-length publications by MIT faculty or staff, and occasionally a pertinent MIT press book not authored by an MIT author. Uh, tonight we are here, as you know, to showcase uh, the new book by Steve Pinker, who is the current Peter de Flores uh, Professor of Psychology here at MIT. And to introduce Professor Pinker, we have the Peter de Flores Emeritus Professor, Samuel J. Kaiser which I think should be a special treat. I know it will be for me. For in my opinion, Jay Kaiser is the preeminent Renaissance man here at MIT. He is an accomplished linguist, administrator, poet, musician, and chronicler of his world's travels and adventures therein. He has two new books, one just published by the MIT Press and co-authored by the late Professor Kenneth L. Hale, entitled Proglamenon to a Theory of Argument Structure. And just to prove my Renaissance man remark, his next book to be published next year by Front Street Books is written for children and will be called The Pond God and Other Stories. Please welcome Professor Kaiser. Thank you all. Uh, can everybody hear me? Uh, I've known uh, Steve Pinker ever since he came to MIT in 1979 uh, as a postdoctoral fellow in the Center for Cognitive Science. Uh, in the course of the last 23 years, I've watched with admiration as he's gone from a talented young researcher to the country's leading voice in bringing cognitive science to an intelligent lay public. And by intelligent lay public, I include my colleagues here at MIT. <laughs> Just two days ago, I attended the Emeriti professor's lunch. I was sitting next to Asher Shapiro, who's been retired for several years now. And Asher asked me if I'd ever read uh, The Language Instinct. I said I had, and he commented on what a terrific writer the author was. He wanted to know if I knew him. This is actually not an infrequent uh, question. Uh, Teresa mentioned that I'm uh, a musician, and a couple of weeks ago I was at a jazz festival in Alexandria Bay, New York. Uh, it's a sleepy little resort town. Uh, in the Thousand Lakes region. It's just across uh, the border from Canada, and it's only about two and a half hours car drive from the town that Steve was uh, born in and grew up in, Montreal. One morning at breakfast, one of the guests, his name was Bert Joss, had heard that I was from MIT. He wanted to know if I knew Steve Pinker. I said, yeah, I did. He asked me to convey this message, which I'm doing now. <laughs> His daughter Susan went to Edinburgh School with your sister. <laughs> and he knows your mother and father. And he sends you all his regards. <laughs> there are many reasons why Steve has become what one writer called, quote, the New Age guru for the machinery of thought. One of those reasons is surely his hair. <laughs> he is a member of the luxuriant flowing hair club for scientists. I want you to know that I deeply resent that <laughs> for obvious reasons. I do acknowledge, however, that there is a connection between Steve's hair and the strength of his scholarship. I think of him more as a Samson than a guru. And I urge you, don't get a haircut, Steve. <laughs> uh, 
Um, there are other reasons for Steve's meteoric rise to national prominence. Here's four of them. The Language Instinct, 1940, 1994. How the Mind Works, 1997. Words and Rules, 1999. And his latest book, The Blank Slate, 2002. His productivity at the rate of one book every two and a half years is extraordinary. Anyone who takes the time and trouble to read these very readable volumes will not only have acquired a crash course in what cognitive science has been able to tell us about how the mind works, but will also have taken the pill with a spoonful of very stylish sugar. Consider, for example, the opening paragraph of Chapter 3 of The Blank Slate. In 1755, Samuel Johnson wrote that his dictionary should not be expected to, quote, change sublunary nature and clear the world at once from folly, vanity, and affectation, end quote. Few people today are familiar with the lovely word, word sublunary, literally below the moon. It alludes to the ancient belief in a strict division between the pristine, lawful, unchanging cosmos above and our grubby, chaotic, fickle earth below. The division was already obsolete when Johnson used the word. Newton had shown that the same force that pulled an apple toward the ground kept the moon in its celestial orbit. That paragraph just about sums up a thousand years of intellectual history in one elegant production. Gems like that are awaiting the attentive reader, and I urge you to it. I think Steve's book comes at an auspicious time. At any rate, I'm someone who is inclined to think about that, to think that something is auspicious when I hear human nature being discussed in the context of Hollywood films. Just the other day, Tim Blake Nelson was being interviewed on NPR. He's the actor who played Bubba in The Good Girl, and he was Delmar in Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And he uh, just wrote and directed a new film called The Gray Zone, uh, it is an account of concentration camp Jews, the so-called Zonderkommandos, Jewish units in Auschwitz who cooperated with the Nazis to help exterminate other Jews to save their own lives. In the course of the interview, Blake said something to the effect that the film was a commentary on human nature, whether it was essentially Lockean or Hobbesian. That is, whether it is a blank slate or one predisposed to being nasty and brutish. He opted for the latter. Steve's book makes it clear what these choices really come down to with an extraordinarily interesting account of the intellectual wars surrounding the question of human nature of the last quarter century. It is both fascinating and disquieting reading. But there is another more pressing reason why I think Steve's book is so timely. In 1960, Carl Jung, the great psychologist, wrote a letter in response to a request that he participate in a world conference on peace. The request came from a man who was a designer of missiles to deliver nuclear warheads. Here, in part, is Jung's reply to that request, and I quote, The jungle is in us, in our unconscious." And we have succeeded in projecting it into the outside world, where now the Saurians are lustily playing about, again, in the form of cars, airplanes, and rockets. If a psychologist should participate in your world conference, he would be up against the thankless task to make his colleagues from other disciplines see where they have the blind spot. The human mind will sacrifice everything for a new gadget, but will carefully refrain from a look into himself. Steve's latest book